Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Christophe Fauger. Welcome to Mastering Money. This is session number five, The Quantum Perspective. Lecture number 16, a little bit of quantum physics, money equals vibration, part one. What are our learning goals for this particular presentation? Number one, the way reality is according to quantum physics. Number two, reality and vibration. And finally, we're going to look at the observer's role and the role of intentionality. Let's begin with a little bit of an introduction to quantum physics. So quantum physics takes root in 1905 with this famous article by Albert Einstein on a photoelectric effect in which he describes light as a stream of particles, whereas in the previous decades, light had been understood as being a wave, just like a sound wave. Einstein receives the Nobel Prize for that particular article. He gets his inspiration from a previous article written by Max Planck in 1900, in which Max Planck describes exchanges of energies as happening in quanta. Thus, the name quantum physics, and quantum physics is the study of of a small scale physical phenomena and the explanation of these phenomena using mathematical modeling. Physicists have discovered that the behavior of this particular system at that scale is very different from those at the macroscopic scale, which is the scale of our visible reality. Up until that point, Newtonian or classical physics had succeeded in explaining most of our physical reality for instance, the motion of planets. But classical physics does not work any longer at the subatomic level. Fun fact, Albert Einstein, who is one of the founders of quantum physics, rejected for most of his career some of those weird implications of that field. And we're going to look at some of those weird implications right now with one of the famous experiments called Young's double slit experiment. Take a light beam and shine it through two slits in a wall. On the other side of that wall, you will see two beams of light emerging. And when this beam of lights hit a wall in the back of the room, they will kind of have a pattern which uh, is similar to a pattern of, of two waves, water waves interacting with one another. On the other hand, if you put a detector at the entrance of each of those slits, then the detector will detect photons passing through one slit at the time. And the pattern that will emerge in the back wall now will be a pattern of two lines of light. This outcome is also verified for other types of particles like electrons or uh, bigger particles called buckyballs. So what are the interpretations of this very famous experiment? Well, the dominating interpretation these days is called the Copenhagen interpretation, and it says that matter has a dual nature. First, matter is a wave. What does it mean? It means that matter can be described as a potentiality or, or probability function. And in a second uh, state, matter is also composed of quanta, or fundamental particles, which only exist once they are measured. And that's a very important point. In other words, at the moment when an observer measures matter, waves of probability collapse into an actualized event or an actualized particle. An alternate theory is that of de Broglie bomb called pilot wave theory. And in that theory, they assert that light is solely made up of particles, so it's not a wave, but that these particles travel on a supporting medium that, make, that behaves like a liquid and thus has waves, which are the waves that pilot the particles. I'm putting a link to these uh, explanations on YouTube. An important question, therefore, emerges about the role of the observer, because the observer really interacts with the experiment. 
So what is the nature of that interaction? <clears throat> Another weird ex experiment is that of quantum entanglement. In a 1935 article, Einstein, Polosky, and Rosen raised that uh, uh, logical, the logical implications of what they call quantum entanglement. They imagine a system with two elementary particles, for instance, an electron and a positron. They have the same mass, but they have opposite charges. And let's entangle them, meaning that let's create a system out of the two. And let's create it so that the sum of their spin or angular momentum cancels out. That means one spin is up for one particle and the other one is down. After this entanglement, we know that these two particles have opposite spins, but it is impossible to know what state the system is in before we observe it. That means we can't not know which particles has a spin up or down if we don't observe the system. Then let's do this experiment. Take that particle number two and send it in a very far distance from particle number one. If we measure the state of particle number one, which is the one that's remained at the, uh, the origin, and one discovers that it went into a spin down, we know immediately that particle number two is in a spin up. But as these two particles are very far apart, how does particle number two know immediately that particle number one has shifted in a down spin? That would violate the fact that information travels at the speed of light, or that it can travel faster than the speed of light, because this happens instantaneously. So that's the paradox of quantum entanglement. <clears throat> Einstein called this type of phenomenon spooky action at a distance. So if we look at the uh, understanding, the current understanding in quantum physics, based on these types of experiments and what we're finding out, then we have really some powerful implications. One, that matter is composed of potential energy, which has the same properties as a wave, just like sound. So in a way, everything around us vibrates. <clears throat> Second, that matter collapses into real particles when that potentiality is actually actualized through observation. Second powerful statement, the observer actualizes the potential. And number three, that information that is contained in a part of the universe is also present at all other levels. That means it can be extracted, extracted instantaneously at all other part, in all other parts of the universe. And that's the quantum entanglement. So everything is connected. Those are three very powerful implications of quantum physics. So now if we try to understand the role of the observer, in the current state, quantum physics has looked at experiments which involve only elementary particles. And in these experiments, we know that the observer has the, looks like, uh, he or she has uh, the power, in a way, to collapse the wave function and make matter, turn matter into an actualized particle. Are these conclusions generalizable to describe the interaction of human beings and reality? That is a very important question. In other words, do human beings have a special status in their role as observers? We don't have a full 100% answer in this uh, particular uh, time uh, that we're living in because the science has not um, provided any answer to this question. But we have some sketches. If we look into uh, spiritual traditions, uh, Hinduism, Shaivism, Buddhism, some of these spiritual traditions speak of consciousness or 
the role of the mind and intention in creating our reality. The observer, or what certain traditions call the witness, plays a key role in these traditions to achieve self-knowledge and reach, reaching inner peace. So what does it have to do with quantum physics? Well, there are several, I'm going to call them rogue physicists, that have started bridging these spiritual traditions with their theoretical physics and in particular doing some experimentations. Sylvester James Gates, for example, has found that the way uh, uh, physics laws seem to happen, it looks like they're, uh, it's almost like they've been programmed in a uh, supercomputer simulations. Amit Goswami looks at the physics of consciousness and many other uh, physicists like John Hagelin, Dean Radin, George Smoot, and so on, are, are kind of interested in these issues and are uh, making headways. So if we look at what we're going to call the matrix version of the role of the observer, which is the way that we conceived, uh, we've been educated to conceive of the, our interaction with the reality, then uh, the observer is us and we observe reality. So reality is out, outside, we observe reality, and in return reality is shaping uh, in this direction here, in this direction uh, is shaping our uh, thoughts. So our thoughts are reactive and we are reacting to, um, to what we perceive outside. That's the matrix version. The messages implicit, you know, in terms of our, our understanding, the messages are uh, in everyday language, face reality, the world is what it is, we can't change it, and in a way, obey authority. That could be derived messages from this particular view. Now we have another version, which is the Wizard of Oz version, and that's closer to what uh, quantum physics is telling us is actually happening. And the observer is actually the, the one that has the active thoughts, and we're going from the inner, the thoughts and the, the observation, to the outer and reality is reacting to the observer okay uh, so the causation goes from the inner to the outer so that's more of what uh, quantum physics tend to suggest and in this case the implicit message that are conveyed to us is that I can co-create my reality the world is evolving I can participate in its evolution I trust myself and I feel empowered. So now let's do a little experiment. I want you to take several minutes to think before answering. Give an example of, in your life of a negative event that took place and that you were convinced of the following. So very important for me to uh, ask you not obviously to dwell on a very emotional event uh, it's not what I'm looking for here, but I would like you to do this experiment and verify something for me. And let's, this event would have the following characteristics. By all means, you wanted to avoid this particular outcome. You feared it. You feared this outcome. You kept obsessing about this particular scenario. You felt worried and stressed and lacked energy when these thoughts and perspective would rise up within you. If in certain circumstances you spoke to others, they agreed with you and sympathized with your fear and worry. And this outcome that you did not want still happened. So I don't want you to dwell emotionally on that, but I want you to verify that maybe those were um, uh, these particular uh, conditions were present when that happened. Now let's turn to a more positive uh, example. So give a new example, this time of a positive event that took place in your life and that you were convinced that the following conditions were met. The odds of success were very, extremely small at the, out, at the outset. You were determined and you had a knowing that this was going to happen. Your desire for this result was unstoppable and felt natural. You were enthusiastic about this prospect and people around you felt that energy and either they gave you encouragement 
They may even have tried some instances to deter you from doing this particular thing you wanted to do. And even though some of these individuals might have sounded discouraging, you still persevered and finally you achieved the desired result. So are there any instances in your life of such event with such conditions? So what are we trying to drive to here? So first, let's be careful. I'm not trying to say to you that it is your fault if bad things or good things happen to you. The key word here is, it's not about fault, it's not about guilt, but I want to leave you with the idea that what we are saying is that by focusing your attention on an outcome, and as we previously seen, there's many instances of such uh, deep focus and, and outcomes as a result of focusing in a case of sports champions, inventors, and successful businessmen and women. Now, focusing your attention tends to produce results in alignment with that intention and the level of dedicated focus and the emotional charge that you put into it. So in the next presentation, we will further explore the toolbox that is available to you and which can empower you to write in a way your life script. So in the meantime, thank you very much for listening and I'll see you soon.